First of all, Letty, I just want to say I'm so excited to talk to you because you are like a major feminist role model. I think this is a really special time. Once again, we're watching a potential female presidential candidate. And so I just want to say that I've just been a huge admirer of yours. Thank and thank you. you so much for bringing so many important conversations to the fore of our cultural conversation. Thank you, Danielle. I'm just thrilled to be cross-generational today. <laughs> makes okay. me feel more relevant. <laughs> <laughs> so before we discuss the meat of the book, and there's a lot of meat in this book, it's so Jewish. <laughs> and I wondered if you could just introduce us to yourself by giving us a little bit of your Jewish background, your Jewish upbringing, mm -hmm. and the sort of formation of your own identity as a Jewish woman. Yes. Um, I'm the child of two very distinct kinds of Jews. My mother was an immigrant, direct from the shtetl in Hungary. She was uneducated because Jewish girls were not educated in her era. Uh, but she was deeply Jewish in old world ways. She was very superstitious. I was raised to you know, not ever have something mended while I was wearing it without chewing. I used to have to chew a thread. How many recognize that? <laughs> so I always interpreted my mother's Judaism as the Judaism of aesthetics, spirituality, and mysticism. Mm -hmm. um, she set a beautiful Shabbat table. She decorated the house for every holiday. She made Queen Esther out of celery and a parsley skirt and pimentos. <laughs> but she made Judaism real and beautiful for me. My father was a scholar. He, um, he taught boys their bar mitzvah parshas. He was a lawyer in an era when, and he graduated in 1923 from NYU Law School, an era when very few Jewish men, um, and he was born here, but barely. His mother was pregnant on the boat. <laughs> he inculcated in me a real sense of Jewish wisdom, Talmud. He was my bat mitzvah tutor and very proud of it. Oh, and I should also say that I was among the first girls to be bat mitzvah in 1952 in mm -hmm. conservative Judaism. So he was enough of a trailblazer to have ensured that I was in that cutting edge generation. But what happened when I was 15, my mother died in 1955, and um, I was not permitted to count in the minion, the quorum of 10 required for public prayer. So my Kaddish didn't count. I didn't count. In 1955, women didn't count. So I walked away from, from Judaism, despite all my training and Jewish education, because my father called the synagogue and had them send a 10th man, a man who held the little memorial prayer book upside down and never had met my mother. The fact that somebody could just kind of pass the physical and be counted in, yeah. and somebody who had been educated and, in fact, was quite a pious little girl. I used to sit on the beam on my father's lap when he was president of our shul in Jamaica, Queens, and yet I didn't count. Um, I walked away <laughs> from Judaism and made and, and feminism. Walked feminism. And walked into feminism. And walked into feminism without having a label. But uh, exclusion, experiences of exclusion are at the root of many of our feminisms, you know? Yeah. The illogic of it, the waste of all the women in our tradition. And for 15 years, um, the only Judaism I practiced was my mother's, home-based Judaism. I had three children. It was entirely up to me to educate them Jewishly because my husband was uh, raised in a very left wing. He was a red diaper baby, if you know what that is. He was raised in a very left-wing household with no Jewish education and no bar mitzvah. So it was all up to me, and I chose to not send my children to Hebrew school or to have them bar or bar mitzvah. I didn't want them to ever confront the feeling I did at the time of my greatest need to be rejected and excluded. But when um, women started to be ordained uh, as rabbis and cantors, 1972 in reform, then later, 1985 in conservative. Um, and when women counted and when women were given aliyot, saying the blessings uh, at the Torah re readings, I m worked my way back. So all of that foundational education, 
underscores, underweaves, interweaves with the characters' experiences in this book. Well, I'm really glad you talk about issues of exclusion because, of course, the, there are many themes to discuss in the book, but the major central one is intermarriage, which is a major issue of exclusion. So why was it important to you to tackle this monstrous topic in, <laughs> in the Jewish conversation and, in, and yeah. in Jewish life and continuity? Their personal reason for that. Um, a little over 20 years ago, you've heard my background, so you might understand this reaction. My daughter fell in love with a Catholic, and um, it became clear that this was going to be a serious relationship. And my daughter uh, shared with me that if they married, she would have to agree to raise their children as Catholics. He was a serious Catholic, and the relationship would be predicated on that. And I, who by that time, you know, been active in the civil rights movement, I, I was involved in the founding of Ms. Magazine, I'm very open-minded, I'm what we used to call tolerant, we don't use that word anymore. <laughs> but uh, nothing human was alien to me, and yet, when she said that, and I imagined suddenly having a grandchild who was baptized, or a daughter with a Christmas tree in her home with a crash underneath. I was blindsided by the gut-wrenching emotions that just hit me. It was absolutely a shocker, out of my control, and so visceral that I blurted out what a woman, a, a mother or a father should never say, you can't do that. <laughs> you can't do that. You can't do that. Yeah. We have lost one-third of our family in the Shoah. We, you can't dead-end this tradition with your branch. And uh, my children and I are very close, but this daughter pulled away and followed this young man to Stanford. We live in New York, all of us. Moved to Stanford with him, and he entered law school. And for nine months, my daughter and I were very, very deeply, profoundly estranged. Mm. And I realized, ultimately, that I had to choose between my daughter and my people, as it were. I had to say, if she chooses to disconnect from this 3,500-year-old chain, that's her life, it's her business, I can't impose my values on her. But the experience, um, the, it left me raw. It left me realizing that for all my sort of philosophical and pol political open-mindedness, uh, my commitment to the survival of the Jewish people was one of the themes that would always motivate my life and my choices. Mm -hmm. But I got on a plane and I flew out to San Francisco and went up to meet her and I said, I will learn to love him if you love him and I will learn to love your children I won't give you up, and I won't imperil our relationship. So four months later, she broke up with him. <laughs> Lucky you. It, it had nothing to do with me, because <laughs> if you ask me, I mean, she keeps reminding me of that, but it's true, because if you ask me, I think I postponed her recognition that this relationship was not right for her, because I had totally posited that it was a Jewish Christian thing, and it really was a, a matter of a whole lot of other incompatibilities mm -hmm. that were sort of swept under the rug in the mm -hmm. act of her rebelling against me. Mm -hmm. So I probably postponed the breakup. I made her push back at me, more importantly, than make a decision about herself. But she did end up marrying a man named David Shapiro from Skokie. <laughs> And they have two magnificent children, of course, whose children aren't magnificent, um, <laughs> who my husband, who's always quick on the draw with apt comments, said there must be an awning somewhere on the Lower East Side in front of a tailor shop or an appetizer store that uses our grandchildren's names, Molly and Benjamin Shapiro. <laughs> <laughs> There are so many profound things that you mm -hmm. just said, and thank you for sharing that. And I want to unpack them a little bit more okay. and talk about what it means in the context of the larger Jewish world. Uh, but first, I realize 
that perhaps not everyone has yet read the book okay. and maybe came today to, to whet their appetite. So I wondered if you could give us the Reader's Digest yes. version of what this book is about. Right. And um, You're an excellent journalist. <laughs> she, really, she really is. Her whole, her whole flow is just right. I'll give you my elevator speech. That's, <laughs> that's you know, if you have like something like 20 floors and find yourself in an elevator cab with a producer or a publisher and you want to sell your idea, you have to be able to sell it in one long sentence. <laughs> so this is a book about the son of Holocaust survivors who promises his mother on her deathbed that he will marry a Jew and raise Jewish children. And he falls in love with a black Baptist ta talk show host. So right there you have the promise, which is a metaphor for Jewish continuity, the promise that presumably we all make to our ancestors to have Jewish grandchildren, to promulgate Judaism, to enliven and enrich Judaism so that uh, future generations will want to embrace it. And you have the complexity of modern life, which is falling in love with the other. Because for the first time in Jewish history, we are not only tolerated, we're accepted and we're even attractive enough to marry. So now if we're going to be destroyed, if we're going to assimilate into the point of, the, into the vanishing point, we don't have an enemy to blame. It's not Amalek on our tail. It's not a, it's not a, a case of bigotry and bias. It's a case of choosing ourselves to dissipate, to um, dilute and to give up. And that's when you have to face, what do we mean when we say we want our grandchildren to be Jewish? Uh, Dean Steinsoff, the famous Tal Talmud scholar, says, um, a Jew is not someone whose grandchildren were, grandparents were Jewish. A Jew is someone who wants his or her grandchildren to be Jewish. That's kind of the package statement about what Jewish continuity is about. And for me, actually, Danielle, to go back to the whole issue of intermarriage, I have no problem with uh, our children marrying out as long as they carry Judaism into the next generation. You can't fight with who you fall in love with. Love is so hard to find to begin with. And if you have found it with somebody who can check off every box, kind, warm, wonderful, fascinating, bright, funny, all the things that matter to you, and you can't check off Jewish, do you throw that person away? Or do you say, uh, I'm going to make this work, but I, I'm going to be the one who says the quid pro quo is our children have to be Jewish. That way, it's, it's not exactly the same wrestling match between love and peoplehood. It's accept love, but insist on peoplehood as well. So another kind of sub-theme in the book, and we're going to come back to intermarriage and, and talk about that a little more in depth, but it's the relationship between blacks and Jews. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask you to start with why you chose the, a woman of color to represent this feminist um, character, but also the other to the Jewish boy, Zach Levy. And, you know, it could have been just an American Christian, it could mm -hmm. have been a white Christian, it could have been an American Muslim. Why the choice of going into the African American community and exploring uh, that dynamic? Two reasons. One, I wanted to establish the parallelisms between us, the Jewish people, with a long history, with inherited trauma, with a sense of heritage, with a lot of rituals, with a lot of culture with a sense of a particular set of values, with a willingness to struggle, that there are parallels in another people, certainly the African-American people. And the second reason is that I know, I know this woman. Cleo Scott is the child of um, a black Baptist minister from Memphis, Tennessee. Her mother was a civil rights activist. She was raised around Jews, because Jews and African Americans are an age-old coalition, the Civil Rights Alliance. We all grew up being proud of the fact that Abraham Joshua Heschel marched arm in arm with Martin Luther King. We've been proud of the fact that we had our martyrs 
Goodman and Schwerner, who died along with Cheney in the mud of a Mississippi River. We all are proud of the fact that of all the volunteers who went south to register black voters uh, in the Mississippi Freedom Summer, 80% were Jews. 80% of the civil rights uh, volunteers who went south to register black voters. We had a lot to be proud of in terms of the black Jewish relationship. So how do I know her? How can I say I can embody her and inhabit her as a character? Because for 10 years, I was part of a black Jewish dialogue group. We met once a month in one another's homes. Uh, we had three rules in that group. You could say anything that you truly felt or had experienced, anything, no matter how painful it might be for the other side to hear. That meant racism, anti-Semitism, stereotype, anything. Number two, you could not slam out of the room no matter how much you got pissed or hurt by what you heard. And the third is that nothing that happened in the room left the room. So it created a very safe space, an authentic space, uh, an, a kind of arena of truth telling. And during the course of 10 years with those ground rules, you learn a lot about another person. And all of us unloaded onto each other. And we lived through moments that were telling in this country in terms of the events of, of that era. The book, um, when, he, when Zach meets Cleo, it's 1984, it's on like page 108 or something. So Zach has a life before then and he is in fact divorced from a Jewish woman who on paper is perfect. That's the thing, on paper perfect. But how many Jewish marriages do we know that go belly up? Because Jewish is not enough in a relationship. It's important, but it's not the only element that makes for happiness and compatibility. In, in this uh, black Jewish dialogue group, as I said, which is where they meet, Zach and Cleo meet in, in an original dialogue group. I was part of it. It was the New York Black Jewish Coalition. It was founded in 1984 in uh, Manhattan uh, by people like Ed Cott and um, David Dinkins and Mandy Patinkin, I think, and, and Ruby Dee and Ozzie Davis. I, a lot of well-meaning, you know, progressive people who said th things have gone too far. What things? Jesse Jackson was running for president in 84 and he called New York City Heimetown. Jews responded by buying a full page ad in the New York Times that said, Jews have to be crazy to vote for Jesse Jackson, who embraced Gaddafi, embraced Arafat, did not disavow Minister Farrakhan, uh, supported uh, Elijah Muhammad, all the, you know, the litany of the anti-Semites of the moment, and Jesse Jackson had not repudiated them, so Jews have to be crazy to vote for Jesse. This on top of the history I just reviewed with you, of the closeness, of the commonality, of the struggle jointly to overcome oppression and work for civil rights laws and freedom and voting rights and um, equal pay and everything. We had shared agendas and suddenly we're at each other's throats. So at that big New York coalition, which was tr a true thing that I was part of, um, my, another woman and I, Harriet Michelle, who at the time was the head of the New York Urban League, a black business group, uh, we caught eyes across the room. We, we rolled our eyes together. We were in the midst of listening to yet another man, sorry guys in the room, this is a sp specific, not general critique, but the guys in this group were constantly negotiating their masculinity with each other. Mm. I, I was on the march with King and Heschel. Oh, I gave the money that established the conference. <laughs> well, I wrote the you know, preamble to the statement of purpose that they released on the day of. They were all sort of polishing their credentials with each other, and we weren't getting anywhere. So Harriet and I met up at the coffee time, coffee break, and we said, the only way to get anything done here is to make a women's group. <laughs> <laughs> And that's what we did. We organized the Black Jewish Women's Group that I told you met for 10 years. Now, I know this is all a long answer, but I need to give you two <laughs> examples because I always want to leave 
a talk like this, encouraging you to start a dialogue group with whoever is the other in your community. What it does it is it, it is epiphanic. It is like dawn breaking to see the world through the eyes of another person. To live through the events of whatever is, let's say, the next 12 months, and to see those same events, not just through your eyes or the eyes of all the Jews you know, but somebody else. How do they see those same events? Mm -hmm. It's life changing. Mm -hmm. It's life changing. Politically, emotionally, familially, every which way. And I'm going to give you two examples. The first year we met, 1984, we happened to be together the morning after the Central Park jogger case hit the papers. You will remember that a jogger, a young woman, was set upon by what it sounded like a mob of black boys who raped her and beat her and hit her head with rocks and left her for dead. So we have our meeting the next day in one of the women's houses, I don't remember whose, and uh, the Jewish women come in, we are ashen, we are appalled, we're just uh, so full of the, the rage of this event, and we're saying things like, what savage kids, who raised these kids? How disgusting, how hateful, what animals? And the African American women are, wait a minute, wait a minute, you don't know if it's true, you don't know if what the cops are saying is how it happened. You don't know if these are the kids. What if the cops picked up just a bunch of kids because they had to deliver? You couldn't let a crime like that be unresolved. And there's always black kids around Central Park. What do you just, you know, put out a net and pull in a bunch of black kids? And most of all, they said to us, these could be our sons. You're not going to get away with calling them animals. You don't know the truth. What happened, as those of you may know who follow the case, those boys were exonerated. And what do we know from like the last year's revelations of police behavior? You don't start by believing the police if you're black. That's not the experience of black people. I knew that in 1984. I have not been looking at the world through white Jewish eyes since 1984. I've always wondered what really happened. What's the truth? And what everybody else in America is deciding now, everyone in our group already was totally, our consciousness had been raised. Well, we knew you were ahead of your time <laughs> before this time, yeah. so no one is surprised. But first of all, wow. I mean, there's a lot of powerful stuff that you just said, and I, I get it. I get that there's something very powerful that happens when you can see the world through the eyes of another. But so there's a very powerful scene in the book a set at one of these dialogue meetings where the two, as you mentioned, where the two main characters meet. And I think actually the view that's presented in the novel is a bit cynical about these dialogue groups and certainly Cleo Scott is cynical about what they can actually accomplish. So I guess the question is beyond that it changes you on the inside, what do these groups accomplish in the world? Great question. Because at the end of the day, what we know right? is that until policy changes and various things like that, absolutely, you're left from 1984 until now, the same things are happening. All right. Not exactly the same things, but that's the, uh, the essence. That's the crux of the, of the question is. And that's why that group fell apart. Not our group. We lasted for 10 years. And the only thing that broke us up was the death of one woman and somebody else moving away, somebody else having a, a bad illness. You know, we fell apart in a kind of organ organic way, not from anything that one could point to as the failure of the, uh, of the uh, enterprise. That group fell apart. The male-female group fell apart, the big one. That was, the book is modeled upon 50 um, people, 25 black uh, New Yorkers, leaders. You know, everybody's a leader. Uh, <laughs> and 25 Jewish New Yorkers. That group fell apart because beside the posturing that I just described, which was a, a huge waste of time and had, and had all kinds of kind of choreography associated with it, uh, who would sit near who and who would talk to who and who was not important enough for somebody to sit with. And, uh, uh, beside that, the blacks always con continually challenged us 
Let's stop talking and start doing. Let's look at police behavior. Let's look at the difference in the school system. Let's look at housing segregation in New York. There's a myth that you know, segregation is a southern phenomenon. Well, walk on the Upper West Side where I live. You know exactly what happens the after West you. West Side of Los Angeles. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> when you walk up past 96th Street, suddenly there are black people. You know, And the Upper West Side is a little more sprinkled below 96th Street, but not on the east side. <laughs> you can go a whole day before you see a black person, and it's usually a doorman. So the truth about the segregated society in America was what the blacks wanted us to look at, and the Jews wanted to keep talking about anti-Semitism and why don't you disavow Farrakhan, and we don't feel safe as long as you're talking against us. And we needed verbal reassurance. They needed action. And the two sides couldn't kind of find a common ground. So, and then there were confrontations that were painful because they didn't have the rule we had in the women's group. So some people were honest and some weren't, and some were talking to the press and some weren't. And it was not, uh, not a workable and uh, constructive exchange. How would you characterize the current state of black-Jewish relations? There's, um, there's a point where Cleo says in the book, you know, why do we need to talk to each other? Aren't your enemies the, aren't your enemies the Muslims? Shouldn't you be dialoguing with them? And shouldn't we be talking to white Christians? So I, I want you to talk a little bit about you know, where are we now and why is it important to continue that conversation? Um, you know, blacks and Jews were a very powerful alliance for, for a lot of the obvious reasons, anyone know, who knows the history. Um, we commanded attention, we commanded the conscience, the conscience, the public conscience, in terms of both being clearly wronged, clearly wronged, and getting together, become, becoming very powerful as a moral force. Today, unfortunately, the black Jewish relationship is almost non-existent. It is um, an aspirational movement. People would like very much to think that there is a link and maybe you, you can point to a few communities where synagogues and churches get together for at signal moments to mark, for example, um, you know, Freedom Summer, there was an event, or to mark Martin Luther King Day, to mark um, a freedom seder at Passover where blacks and Jews do a seder together. There are moments like that. But there aren't um, the commonalities of commitment. Um, and the sad thing is I fault our community because we've become so impacted. And our concerns now are almost exclusively self-defense, Israel and anti-Semitism. Mm. That's where our money goes. That's where our programming goes. That's where the passion, you can rouse the passion. And whereas I grew up in a world where the proudest thing you could do was you know, march in a, in a parade for the rights of somebody else less powerful than you, um, or to beat at the doors of the power structure in order to get some other group rights that we have but they don't, that used to be the definition of Jewish values uh, in my childhood, was uh, to activate what we learn in the, in the Seder every year. We were slaves in Egypt, and therefore we understand the stranger. And we will not oppress the stranger because we were slaves in Egypt. So it's not enough to know our own history, but to extrapolate from our own origins. And we find our origins in slavery, how many people find their origins in heroic moments and triumphant battles? And you know, you find your origin in some some mythological, Rom, you know, Romulus Remus. And that <laughs> Jews find our origins in slavery. Why? Because of the commandment to empathize, which is in Exodus twenty three nine. That what I just said. That is the commandment to uh, empathize. You were strangers in the land of Egypt. You shall not oppress the stranger because you were strangers in Mitzrayim. So our mission to, to be a liberatory force, to identify with outgroups and underdogs, and to help and to free people, that's been lost too much. Now I will not say all lost, 
but certainly it is not the kind of leading edge of what you would call your people's Jewish identity. Well, I'm really glad you brought up uh, self-defense and anti-Semitism because that is the perfect segue to talking about another major aspect of the novel, which is this really looming backstory of the Holocaust. Yes. So Zach is the son of survivors, as you mentioned. And, but what you didn't mention, and without giving away too many spoilers, something had happened in the background that made the mother's request to, to replenish the six million even more pressing on, on the heart of her, of her son. So is that an unfair burden to place on a Jewish child? Or is that actually a condition of being Jewish in a post-Holocaust world? Mm -hmm. This is a lot of seichel in this young woman. <laughs> no, <laughs> really, I, I'm interviewed all the time and I just don't get these kinds of questions. <laughs> Seriously, Danielle, thank you very much for what you obviously put into this preparation. Um, I was not the child of Holocaust survivors, but um, I was a child during the Second World War and I was raised with a daily consciousness of the fact that Jews were being murdered. Uh, my parents were very active, trying to alert the American community, trying to push the American Jewish community to own up. There was, if you were alive then, there was an impulse to tamp down the demands on Roosevelt because for fear of arousing anti-Semitism as a backlash, that if America ever thought that this was a Jewish war, that would be the end of it. There would be no... Uh, public support for American boys, and they were mostly boys, and dying for the Jews. So it was not, it was made a war against Nazism, a war against Hitler, and not a war to uh, free the Jews or bomb the tracks on the way to Auschwitz or any, anything that would have focused in on that subtext, which was not really a subtext. I'm being raised in a household where whatever was on the front pages didn't matter. What was on the front pages at my breakfast table was, who, who did we lose? What care package came back, address unknown, that was sent to a family member? In the end, one third of each of my sides, my father's and my mother's sides, perished. So though I wasn't a child of the Holocaust, I was a child of the Holocaust in that way, in the way of consciousness, in the way of inherited, what I call inherited trauma. That is a very long shadow. And even though we try not to, and I tried not to raise my children with the sense of, uh oh, they want to kill us. You know, the old joke, what every holiday is about. It's about they tried to kill us, we won, let's eat. <laughs> so I, I tried not to raise my children with a, vic a sense of potential victimization, which is a really terrible way to have to live. Nonetheless, the shadow is there. And, and never again, as a rallying cry for our Jewish identity, remains very powerful. Um, and anybody with um, a any awareness of the various tragedies that have befallen us, and you know the fact that you know zahor is a is a is a, a, a byword. Remember, zahor. We hear it all the time. We remember everything. We remember Haman. We remember Amalek. We remember, you know, the kings and the oppressors and the Inquisition. We're always remembering who did what to us. You can't help absorb that. And to the degree that your parents, I guess, or your family has made that part of your obligation to your people, which obviously I felt, and which my daughter pushed back on, I guess you know it, but maybe I need to say it. That daughter became a bat mitzvah at the age of 40 and is today the president of Central Synagogue in New York, which is one of the <laughs> largest reform synagogues. They have 6,000 members. So she went whole hog into forming her own Jewish identity, not the one I would have made for her. We go to different shuls. It's like the old joke. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Three Jews, you have to have four Jews, one that everyone doesn't go to. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, both your main characters in the book come from these very strong ethnic or racial and religious backgrounds. 
So I wanted to ask you, and especially knowing how much time you spent in dialogue with, um, with, with black women, do you think that the emphasis on in-group marriage is in any way inherently racist? Um, you know, that's like asking me if uh, Israel is racist. You know, you can make the case because we privilege Jewish immigration. Uh, because uh, in Israel, different appropriations go to different neighborhoods. You can make the case. If you ever went to Hebron, you can really make the case. Separate sidewalks, you know, the, the most grotesque kind of uh, uh, graffiti, and uh, uh, it's horrific. You can make the case, but to me, Israel is not a racist society. You can make the case, but it's not a racist society. So you can make the case that requiring or requesting our children to marry in is a rejection of the other. Or you can make the case that it's an awareness that unless we perpetuate ourselves, we'll be lost. I choose to make the second case. So do you think that intermarriage is a, is a greater blessing or a greater challenge to the Jewish community, considering that there is such a deep concern that intermarriage, and the numbers are almost overwhelmingly in support of the fact that when intermarriage does occur, the children almost never are raised Jewish and go on to lead well, Jewish there, lives. There are signs now, very, very recent signs and studies that have just, just been uh, released, that that's changing. I'll back up and agree with what uh, Danielle just said, and that is if you looked at the 2013 Pew s uh, survey, you saw that 80%, 8 out of 10, non-Orthodox Jews have non-Jewish spouses. 8 out of 10 have non-Jewish spouses. The corollary to that is of the 7 point something million Jews in this country, 2 point something do not identify as Jews. In other words, these are people with at least one Jewish parent, so you could say patrilineally if you're reform, matrilineally if you're conservative, there are 7 million Jews by that definition, father or mother, and 2 point something million who don't identify. So what's going to happen to their children? The children who, who had the one parent who wasn't welcomed into a synagogue, who wasn't allowed on the bima, who wasn't encouraged to participate in Jewish life so that perhaps that non-Jew would uh, respond to what it is that we feel is worth continuing. So what conclusion did you come to? My conclusion is we should not fight intermarriage. We should fight for um, what you might call birthright Judaism. You know, the way we pour money into birthright Israel. We pour money in, as if sending a kid there for, for a month or t for a week or 10 days is going to make a pro-Israel, smart, able to argue, totally informed young person. Uh-uh. It's a person who had fun. A person who saw really interesting sights. A person who may be hooked up while in Israel <laughs> with a Jewish person, which if we're into matchmaking, that's not enough. If we're into Jews marrying Jews, we need to be sure there's an actual legacy worth perpetuating on the part of the person who is looking at his or her upbringing and saying, I want my kids to have this. Well, I'm glad you said that because I wanted to ask you as a Jewish parent, what did you most want to impart to your children about Judaism? And I want to ask you the same thing insofar as your grandchildren are concerned, and is it different? Yeah. Um, well, I gave you the complicated reasons why I left Judaism, and then I came back. So when I came back, my kids were already grown. For the 15 years I was estranged were the years I was raising my children. So the Judaism they got was my mother's Judaism. You know, I would never sew anything without them chewing a thread. <laughs> I, I went poo 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 on their forehead every time anybody said anything good because we all know that the evil eye will <laughs> want to hit you if anybody envies your child and thinks the kid is cute. You got to <laughs> suck out the evil eye. That I was raised with that. I had two poo poo on my head every night when I went to sleep. Um, you know, I, when my girls first menstruated, I, I slapped them the way I was slapped. <laughs> How many women were slapped? Okay, uh, you get slapped, and your mother yeah. says something in Yiddish. And I asked my mother, I said, I've never been hit. What is going on here? <laughs> and she said, I just asked God 
to make this slap the worst pain you ever know as a woman. Mm. It didn't work, but, <laughs> but think about it. You this gotta was, have dreams. This was a simple, a simple Judaism, an uneducated woman's way of saying, I'm gonna try to control things. Be I can't get close to God in the way m my husband does and the men in, in our community do. I can't, I'm not educated, I'm not valued, I'm not allowed in the minion, I'm not allowed near the Torah. Uh, you know, I'm unclean, <laughs> um, but I can get rid of the evil eye, which is the other side of it. I can take care of the bad stuff and let him get, get the good stuff. Um, the first time that I ever had an aliyah, mind you, um, when I was a child, I was bat mitzvah on Friday night. How many people were bat mitzvah on Friday night? Okay, not enough old people in the room. <laughs> because in my time, you could not be bat mitzvah. If you were a girl, you couldn't be bat mitzvah on uh, Saturday morning. And you didn't read the Torah. You read from a, from a, a, a sidur. You read whatever was the haftarah for that week. You did not read the, uh, the Torah portion for that week. So the first time I was actually given an aliyah, which was about 1974, and in 1974, I was 34, I'm up on the bima, and I absolutely levitated at the sight of the Torah from this angle. <coughs> the intimacy of standing there, of taking, you know, the pointer, the yacht, doing this, kissing and, and blessing this beautiful scroll and seeing it, you know, the I-thou <laughs> relationship, instead of, that's the way it was for women in my day. And when it was this intimate, I felt like I was levitating. And I choked up, I could hardly finish um, the brachot, honestly. So for, you know, for me, I c didn't give my children that. I, because I didn't want them to have to have like that great moment of revelation of thank you. You know, I've been a supplicant for 34 years. Thank you, finally. I can relate to my own, my own Torah in this really deep way. I didn't want them to have that. So what did I give them? I gave them my mother's Judaism. I gave them, you know, the beautiful Shabbat table and the blessings and a good talking to about Jewish values. In terms of my grandchildren, you know, I learned my lesson when I said to my daughter, you can't do that. So I had nothing to say about how they were raised. Um, five of the six of them have been a bar or bat mitzvah. The sixth is, has dyslexia, and it just was too hard for him. Uh, I hope that he will have an education uh, in Judaism, but he's right now a little guy struggling just with English. Uh, but I think that what I imparted and what my husband, in terms of his values and his good, solid, you know, neshama, his soul, his, his politics, his, um, uh, it's a kind of a loving kindness Judaism that came out of his household. That seems to have carried them pretty well. It's Cleo in the book who brings up the fact that in, oftentimes in religious conversation, and of course we could extrapolate that to the Bible itself, that male pronouns are always used. Yes. And you being this glamorous, famous feminist that you are, I wanted to ask you, what bothers you most about classical Judaism's attitude towards women? Oh, we don't have enough time <laughs> I here. Know. We, don't. we don't have enough time. But another thing on top of that, what bothers you, I want to know where, if in any place, you find female empowerment in Judaism. Mm. Great questions. So what bothers me, I, I cannot sit behind a mechitza. As a result, I don't go to Orthodox synagogues and I'm probably missing some very beautiful services, you know, because I, I know the service, so I could be part of it. I cannot sit behind a mechitza. It's like, I don't know, it's asking me to be tall. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's, that's one thing. Uh, the God language bothers me. In fact, when I'm in a non-progressive Synagogue, my synagogue is B'nai Jeshurun in New York. You may know a little bit about it. Uh, 
all of the God language has been, in Hebrew, has been balanced. I mean, we don't just have a vote. We have imaot, not just our forefathers, our foremothers. We mention the foremothers by name and all the brachot, and so on down the line. So I feel entirely comfortable in my own synagogue, and very often, when I'm in someone else's synagogue that doesn't do that, I'm like blithering over the words because I'm saying Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, Valea, and they're off on the rest of the blessing. But I, I'm so used to saying it <laughs> that I'm the only one saying it. You know, um, So I, I do the corrective in my mind. Um, if I hear that there's a man who still says, thank God for not creating me a woman as part of his morning prayers. You give I, him a smack. Like I don't, want, I don't want to know him. <laughs> I mean, I really don't want to know him if he needs to say that, if he needs to jack himself up by putting us down. No pun intended. Yeah, no pun intended. So there's also the attitudinal thing in Jewish communal life where women are given a testimonial lunch when they've spent their whole lives in the Jewish world and men get a testimonial dinner. And that's not a small thing. It's a measure. Um, and also still the, the positions of leadership in the Jewish absolutely. nonprofit world and the right. Jewish community at large throughout the country are still largely exactly. occupied by men. Exactly. Like in a big way. Yeah. So what? you asked me on the positive side. What yeah, what do uh, sources of uh, female empowerment oh, yeah. in Judaism? Uh, what thrills me is to go to anything that's sponsored by Jofa. Does anyone know what Jofa is? Jewish Orthodox Feminist Alliance. Because that's when, and, and everybody, or a lot of people, their first response is, that's an oxymoron. <laughs> you know, a Jewish Orthodox feminist, how could that be? But if you want to be inspired, these are the most knowledgeable Jewish women on the planet, really. They're scholars. They are, they know every single thing about the service that's problematic, you know, they know when you say this and when you say that and when you have to have a minion and when you don't. And, uh, it's, it's an education just to see how educated they are and they have found ways to empower themselves and their voices. So I'm very moved. In a women's tefillah group that's run by Jofa, I'm very moved by the women of the wall mm -hmm. in Israel. Mm -hmm who have struggled since 1988. I was there at the first, first uh, International Jewish Feminist Conference in Jerusalem. Uh, and they have been struggling ever since then to uh, just gain the acceptance of two things that are halachically acceptable, permissible. They want to be able to pray with a Torah and wear a talit. And they're not allowed to do either even though halacha says they are. I don't know if you, uh, you all know it, but a menstruating woman can hold a Torah. A menstruating woman can hold a Torah. There is nothing that can make a Torah unclean. Hmm. Okay? So anytime that's used against us, you have to know the halacha. Yeah. It's, not, it's not true. It's used against us. It's used for us to, to self-abnegate, to hmm. think badly of ourselves, to feel secondary. So what can Judaism learn from feminism? <sighs> yeah, well, feminism was my religion for a long time. Uh, what feminism can learn from Judaism is, you know, hang in there. <laughs> because, you know, Judaism has been threatened and uh, um, excoriated and beaten down and silenced and made to hide, and it's here. We're here. Um, Feminism can learn, think about how you do that. How do you create that kind of loyalty and fealty? Um, and what Judaism can learn from feminism is, you know, women matter. Pretend women matter. Pretend you have a, a faith in which women matter. And activate Hillel's very famous al regalachad, the thing that Hillel said um, to the, the potential convert who said, um, can you summarize the entire Torah while I'm standing on one leg? And Hillel said, sure. Do not do unto others what is hateful to you. To that, and he said, all the rest is commentary. Okay? So if he would... That's this, in the book, by the way. This great, you it's need a refresher course Because later. it's my absolutely most famous... It's very famous, and it's my most favorite justification for treating women as if we matter. 
Do not do unto others what is hateful unto you. Would you like to be behind a screen? Would you like to have your prayers not count? Would you like to be judged unworthy of holding a Torah? Would you like to be pushed away from your own faith? Would you like to not be allowed near a grave? Because somehow you'll be smirched this process? And if you can answer, no, I would not. I'm a Jew who would not like to be kept away from all of this. Then you are committing a sin by what you're doing to us. Thank you for that. Um, wow. So the last thing I want to ask you, and then, yes, that definitely deserves a round of applause. Um, I'm going to ask you one last question, and then we'll open it up. So considering how much time God knows a writer has to spend eons immersed in the world in which they are about to put, put onto the page, and you explored such important, significant, and sensitive topics, the Holocaust, intermarriage, and, and feminism, and the role of feminism in our society. So after having spent all this time thinking about this, do you, do you worry for the Jewish future of your grandchildren? Uh, in terms of just my grandchildren's generation, if I look over here at certain things that are happening, Jewish camps, some wonderful you know, programs, and birthright when it works right, when it doesn't just go to the good places, but it goes to the, the, the poor Palestinian villages and the poor Jewish development towns, and it shows you what's really going on in the refugee camps, and it allows you to talk to people who are in NGOs that disagree with the government. If that kind of birthright trip was available, I would say we can save the Jewish people by treating our young people as though they can absorb the negative along with the positive, not as if they have to be silenced and that they have to be given a script. Because kids are running away from Israel because they're given a script and they can't morally justify it. Mm -hmm. Because they were raised up with our the theses of our people, which is to free the oppressed, and they're watching uh, the oppressed right under their noses in, in Israel. So that has to be brought into the present. I think in terms of making Jews, Judaism beautiful and making intermarried, because that's, that's part of the wonder of being accepted and loved and people wanting to marry you, is that it's going to happen more and more. It's going to happen. If there was a whole lot of new waves of anti-Semitism, people would no longer want to be married to us. But as long as they're marrying us, we need to actually grapple with how to make Judaism worth promulgating and perpetuating. And that's where I think we need birthright Judaism. And that's where I think we need, for example, when we say how much Jewish continuity matters to us, what's the content of that continuity? So you worry, you don't worry. I do both. I mean, <laughs> What a Jewish it, it, answer. Yeah, it's on the one hand and on the other hand, and I mean, we even have three hands at times From for Hitler. certain issues. <laughs> well, Letty, thank you. Let's give a round thank of applause. You. Thank you, thank you. Um, thank you so much for your just deeply thoughtful thank answers. You. And now we have some time to entertain questions from the audience. So, who wants to start? Yes. Um, I just want to say there is a new birthright now for kind of converted Jews who have married or are going to marry Jews. Mm -hmm. So, this is very exciting to me because I'm involved. Is that for, to go to Israel with that group? To go to Israel. But what about the Judaism part? They have, this is through here. Mm -hmm. I Mm -hmm. where, where they are converts. Right. And, and, then, and then they can go the next step. Mm -hmm. it's been Let me say one thing about uh, adult education. I know some wonderful adult education programs. Uh, presumably this conversion program is one of them. Where probably the converts know more than the rest of us Absolutely. when you're done and are more excited about Judaism mm -hmm. than the rest of us. We need to transport that in some form to the three-year-olds, mm -hmm. and the five-year-olds, mm -hmm. and the eight-year-olds. Mm -hmm. How many people in this room went to Hebrew school? How many people in this room loved Hebrew school? <laughs> <laughs> I rest my kids. There's something wrong with the educational process in that the faster you can run away after your bar about mitzvah, the faster you're out of here. My editor always says we lost an entire generation of Jews to Hebrew yeah, school. Exactly. <laughs> Um, yes, go ahead. What you just said was about the lack of education. 
Um, I have three children, and two of them married outside of the Jewish religion. And I tried the exact te technique that you did about trying to accept, because I always believe that if I don't accept, then I lose the child. So rather than tell this child, I don't accept you marrying a Catholic guy, I embraced it. And he asked for permission to give her a ring, and I thought, oh my God, I can't believe I'm going to say yes to this, because I was so against it. And my parents kept saying it was my fault, you know, for, you know it, well, it was the Jewish guilt. I always say that it was, it's really hard to be a Jew, because mm -hmm. it comes with so much guilt and shtick. But Never was there a truer statement <laughs> utter. <laughs> well, you know, I just, I've always believed that. And my parents just constantly said she wouldn't be marrying a Jew. You know, she wouldn't be marrying outside her Jewish religion if I didn't do a better job. And... I mean, her father it was an Israeli. We went to Chabad. So what more could I have done? But, but I think as the years have gone by, and, and I have a son who's with a non-Jewish woman, and I'm constantly saying to myself, how do I make this baby Jewish? You know, like, before the other side family gets their hands on her. And so I'm constantly saying, oh, I can't wait for her to be a little older so I can start Hanukkah with her. And, um, and I think that what I hear my kids always say is that I schlepped them to Chabad, but they never quite understood what they were doing there. Right. They, you know, we talk about, you know, Passover, like, what? What is Passover? <laughs> and what's with this Purim stuff? And, and you know, you know, you... It's, you, Jewish, you, it's the Jewish Halloween. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, so you, you bring... You sound like Joy Behar. <laughs> no, but the thing is, you know... You, you try to raise your children, and um, you know you try to say, well, living here in California, there isn't this typical Jewish community. I was brought up in a very Jewish community back east, Long you know, Island or Brooklyn, Brooklyn. Yeah. 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 Beach. You know, it was a very Jewish yeah. community. And, yeah. and my daughter used to, said to me, you know, you used to make us open the book when you would do the prayers in the temple, and she said those words they didn't make sense. I, we didn't know what the prayers meant. That's the point I'm saying about Jewish uh, education for adults. Right. doesn't content itself with, Absolutely. you've got to learn to read, and that's it. You've got to know these prayers, and that's it. Right. Jewish education for adults yeah. is about, here's why this is worth it. This is what brilliance of Judaism is. Mm -hmm. This is this heritage. This is your legacy. Mm -hmm. Embrace it. You know, I always say that, that uh, Jews know all the French wine vintages. But they don't know, like, when the Second Temple sat. Or, you know, what is Joshua known for? Well, we can learn that. And we can, learn, we can drill down and figure out why this matters. That it's not just the memorize, the battles, and the, and the rituals. But why? The why is what's so brilliant. Well, one thing also I'd love to point out is that part of the reason that we have limited access points, which is something that's changing in certain ways, is because most of us don't have Hebrew. So if you don't, our tradition is, is mostly in Hebrew, some in Aramaic. So if you don't have access to those languages, you don't have access to so many of the texts of our tradition, and even just the prayer book, mm -hmm. you know, to really understand the beautiful poetry that is the liturgy of our tradition, it doesn't come off quite as seductive when it gets translated by, you know, JPS or whatever. Um, okay, a question. Can you talk a bit about Ma Ms. Magazine? I oh, yeah. was in elementary school and I yeah. don't remember. Okay. Um, well, Ms. was founded in 1972. <coughs> we actually appeared in the end of the year um, issue of New York Magazine and we were introduced. So a section from the magazine was inserted in New York Magazine and it was kind of the talk of the town. And then the first issue of the magazine came out in, in January. And we put everything we could possibly think of into that first issue because we thought there may never be a second. <laughs> <laughs> the so there's the first issue. Thank you for bringing that. And that cover shows, uh, it's a, based on an Indian goddess. We made her skin blue because we were aware of racism and we did not want her to be white. Mm -hmm. And we have the arms, if you can see it. Each arm is holding something iconic that's associated with women. So read off what each arm is holding. Uh, a clock. A, a baby, right? There's no baby. What, what is there about the motherhood? Something. Oh, a fry, frying an egg. 
Right on her typewriter. Her baby is in her. And her oh, the baby's is in her. her. Right. Yeah. Uh, she's crying and a telephone, uh, a, a mirror, a car wheel, and one of the things are lasters. An iron. <laughs> <laughs> iron. So we were trying to cover all the bases. But we inside we, we had stories on how to have an egalitarian marriage contract. Uh, I have a piece in there on non sexist childbearing. Raising children without sexual purity. Stand in the doorway of your child's room and ask yourself if you can move an opposite sex child into that room. So if you have a seven year old girl Stand in the doorway and say, could I move a seven-year-old boy in this room? And would he he'd be comfortable? And if he wouldn't, you're stereotyping your children. <laughs> You've got to have the options, the options for, you know, doll playing trucks, for blocks and, and fairy tales, and cooking things and uh, active play. By the way, I just have to tell you, I just love seeing that figure on the cover. I recently interviewed the author Erica Jong, as some of you may know. Um, I'm sure uh, that does not surprise me. But um, in the middle of our interview, she started talking about what's happening in the Middle East, and she mentioned ISIS, but she goes, but I refuse to call it ISIS because ISIS is the ancient female goddess, and it is a denigration of that name to refer to the Islamic state as ISIS. So I won't call it that. And I thought, wow, like it's it's, it's in the detail. You know? So when you said about coloring it blue, I appreciated that. Okay, a couple more questions. Um, how about this lady right here? Well, it's, it's a comment, and that is that what you did worked because my daughter not only have non-gender things, but it goes further than toys. They don't talk about boyfriends or girlfriends. They don't talk about somebody down the street who has two mothers or two fathers. <laughs> this is totally Except. acceptable. Yeah. And normal. But they do live in sports books. We'll take these three last questions, and then you can we'll talk see. to Letty afterwards. OK, let's start over here. Yeah, I wanted to make a comment. Um, when I was in graduate school and I interviewed my grandmother, who was part of the helping women get the right to vote. And recently my son had a female friend who was just so enthralled that I fought for the Equal Rights Amendment. And I marched. And she came to interview me and talk and I thought, look at the, you know, the generation. Because I remember Ms. Maggie. I remember thinking that was so important. I went to a feminist college. and. You know, all that was so different. So um, to, to see the progression, to see um, things that are changing from the generation of my grandmother and now my sons who think, look what my mother did. Right. Even though it didn't go the way we wanted to be. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's constant. I remember in 1977, my th myself thinking, you know, we're making so much progress. Yeah, we'll be done then. by 1980. <laughs> <laughs> and then the country elected Ronald Reagan. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. We're just fighting here in the stripes. Um, and we're still fighting. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. Contraception. So. Yeah. Yep. So I'm completely in awe of you <laughs> and how well thought out all of your. I'll call it a position, but it doesn't seem like a position. It seems like it comes from your heart. I'm really concerned about the um, Muslim-Jewish relationships and this sort of this widespread negative stereotyping. And you talk a lot about the blacks and the Jews, but that's where my concern is going these days, and I wonder if you could just... Yes. I want to take you with me. Yes, but please you do. Get into these conversations. Please, please do. Thank so, you for asking a question. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, no, I am glad you asked that, because the, one of the most important things in my life is my Palestinian Jewish dialogue group. We have some Muslims and some Christians, some you know, Palestinians come in various forms, some who are unaffiliated, but we have that. Christians and Muslims, and um, it's, it's as familiar to me as any of the anti-Semitic incidents that I know about. Islamophobia, the fact that people have tarred an entire people based on their extremists, we know from that, you know? 
I do not want the Jewish people to be embodied in Yigal alone, who killed Rabin. I don't want the Jewish people to be embodied by settlers who put masks on their faces and throw feces on Palestinians. That's not the Jewish people. But you could look at that and say, look at these Jews. Look what they do. So, you know, it, it, as a movement person, you can just you can take my template and move it into any area of um, contention. And you need to always say, the individual. Where's the individual? Where's the individual story? Not the tarring with one brush. Not, not seeing the world through Jewish eyes, as I said when you know something happens that looks bad for us, wait a minute, you know, is it just bad for us or can we I mean Charlie Hebdo and the kosher supermarket. Mm -hmm. Okay, there are a lot of people who are talking about Charlie Hebdo, the magazine, and not the kosher supermarket. In that case, you know, we need to say, wait a minute, there were Jews targeted here simply for being Jews. But other times it's not about us. You know, it's not about us the Iran deal, which Benjamin Netanyahu, to my great dismay, made it about Israel. Mm -hmm. So that anything that happens in the future between the U.S. and Iran is going to be sullied by the fact that it may be what is the U.S. doing because of Israel. How did the Jewish lobby get the U.S. to do this because of Israel? He made it all about you know the survival of Israel, whereas... The Iranian nuclear threat is a problem to everybody. So we can't allow things to kind of get flattened out and compartmentalized. We have to keep pulling out the skein of truth. This is about us, this isn't. This is about an individual, not a group. And so on. We, we, we are sentient human beings, and we have the capacity to do that. And we need to fight back when we hear that kind of crap. Okay, I just want to tell you that remember when we hung our bras out. Our bras, we, we put them in an ash can. Oh, we're supposed to hang them out. And my son always said, the day you hung your bra out was the day I became a Republican. <laughs> okay, so let's get one more round of applause. Buddy, thank you for your wisdom and the insight and the experience of everything that you have in this conversation. I appreciate it. I'm making a bigger fan. <laughs> Thank you all for coming.